This video is sponsored by Skillshare. The first thousand people who use the link in my description will receive a one month free trial to Skillshare Premium. What's odd is that I now also have to specify that this video is not sponsored by a certain dog food brand, given that there's a chance you'll probably see some of their marketing material appear pretty squarely in portions of this video. I did not receive any money from said dog food brand, and personally, as I'm under no obligation to them, I think there are many better dog food brands available. And I certainly did not expect to have to open a video about a racing game with a teardown of dog food, but with Trackmania 2020, such is the world we live in. Turns out this change to introduce in-game advertising was implemented only a month or so after the game's initial release last year. And look, if there's anyone who understands the need for ads to keep the lights on, it's me. So trust me, I'm not judging on that alone. It's just that in this instance, there's something of a ripple effect that ends up unraveling yet more problems. See, there is an option to stop these ads from being displayed buried deep in the game's ridiculously laid out settings. That is, if you are a paid subscriber, which I am and have been since launch, I guess the latest update flipped that switch back or something. In fact, I've actually paid over and above the going rate for premium membership, because with the inelegant introduction of this wildly messaged payment model, there isn't a clear upgrade path if, say, you took a chance on the middle tier and want to try the next one up. And and, you know, it should have been so much simpler than this. Last year, I made a video about how Trackmania has all the trappings of a series that should be the biggest in the world. Its remarkably pure arcade time trial racing is addictive as all hell, and few games convey a feeling of speed quite like it. But these mechanical qualities have always managed to butt up against decisions taken on a development or publisher level that seem to leave larger worldwide audiences more confused than intrigued, and place the series squarely in the position of unwieldy niche. In 2020's case, it felt impossible for conversations surrounding the game not to devolve into talk of its release model. What should have just been explained as, hey, free players get the campaign courses that roll over seasonally, with paid users getting access to social features, like player-made tracks and customization. But instead, it all became this massive tug of war between players and developers as to whether said players were subscribing to the game or renting it, resulting in a situation which, Given the almost immediate introduction of ads, I can't imagine was doing huge numbers for Nadeo, at least initially. But a year into this thing, and purely anecdotally, player counts seemed to be up from where they were just a few months post-release, back when you could seemingly find just as many players going back to Trackmania 2, Turbo, and even Nations, the still free-to-play game from 2006 that 2020's entry was supposedly remaking. That said, with Trackmania finally getting some brief visibility marketing a major new update, does this spell a more prosperous future for this platform? After a year of playing with this release mod, am I likely to renew my now dwindling subscription? Well, the answer to both is, uh, complicated. In some ways, Trackmania is in the best spot it's been since its launch, but it's been a pretty bumpy ride up to this point. On the level that's most important, Trackmania's gameplay remains almost exactly as it was before, meaning it's still some of the most fun you can have with a racing game, but it's been in need of a shot in the arm for quite some time. For context, I've been checking in on the game every time the season rolls around and we're presented with 25 new tracks on which to continually shave milliseconds off our best times. And well, the decline in quality over the year was beginning to feel more and more apparent, with the developer courses often as janky as they were downright mundane. While the community courses remained a font of creativity, seeing players able to almost redefine what the game even is on both a visual and mechanical level, the complete lack of meaningful updates to the game's abysmal UI or any kind of coherent curation tool meant that it was becoming harder to find these gems than ever. This approach left many, it would seem, to stick with the rather thoughtless obstacle spam that for me came to define the campaign tracks over the year. I was starting to question if the team at Nadeo had just left this game to die, committed to chucking out a set of tracks every so often to say the people like me daft enough to pay for a subscription, but doing so with only the slightest hint of care. It was a stagnancy that you could see bearing out in the already fragmented player base, with the few new additions being added in terms of matchmaking betas and the like, for ranked modes being so barren at the point of their introduction that it was impossible for me to actually get a game in there until fairly recently. Recently, that is, when the summer update rolled around for the game's anniversary. Marked by a small announcement during Ubisoft's E3 showing, arguably the most attention the publisher has paid to the series in years, this update leans into the playful 
playful, carefree exuberance of summer holidays, and in doing so, feels like the break from monotony that Trackmania 2020 so desperately required. Look, I may just be susceptible to visual trickery and bright colours here, but there's a vibrancy to this new set of tracks that had previously been sorely lacking. There's a care put into obstacle placement here, which, combined with the introduction of physics features like water from previous iterations in the series, allows for some of the smartest, most refreshing track design seen in these campaign rollovers. It's definitely the most satisfying challenge I've had trying to get the absolute best times possible on these maps. The jump between silver and gold medals feels more monumental than ever, but crucially this gap is anything other than arbitrary, requiring more lateral thought about how the course's very physics function so that you might find clever workarounds or even skips over entire sections of track. Nadeo seems to be rewarding thoughtful play in a way that hadn't always been so readily apparent. And weirdly, this fresh approach to course design can likely be traced to the game's new Royal Mode, one of the most prominent new features here. In true Trackmania fashion, this mode sees the game capitalise on an aesthetic trend from last year and a gameplay trend that peaked even further back than that. It was perhaps the main reason I wanted to make this video, being a fairly left-field inclusion on its own, and one of the first new modes where it seemed possible to actually fill a lobby of players. For what it's worth, the mode is pretty fun, with the Fall Guys inspired visual palettes reflected in its Takeshi's Castle-esque gameplay. You team up with two teammates as you struggle through different iterations of a course littered with crazy hazards, thin pathways and exaggerated physics thwarting you at every step of the way. Add in the ghosts of all players at once and the ability to zap to the next part of the track once a teammate has beaten your current one, and you're often left breathlessly trying to figure out where exactly you are. Part of the charm of Trackmania has always been the chaotic nature of its multiplayer, and this royal mode seems to be bringing out a different side of that chaos. That said, it's difficult not to feel like the gameplay here is at odds with Trackmania as a whole. Sure, precision has always been a key aspect of the game's identity, and this mode demands it, but the mechanical unpredictability of this mode's new tile set leads to a style of play that also sacrifices the speed that makes Trackmania so special to me. It makes me question the mode's longevity, especially seeing as a lot of its popularity relative to other modes right now seems to come from a the renewed interest generated by the the aforementioned E3 showing, and b that Nadeo seems to have placed other multiplayer modes to the wayside in favour of featuring the royal mode more prominently in the menu. You know, the game's UI was already terrible, but after this recent update, I suddenly found it more difficult than before to just play some Trackmania courses with other people, because that feature is now hidden behind the arcade mode, which before seemed like it existed purely to house those Mario Kart tracks. In short, it feels like Nadeo is banking on this mode to drive interest in the game in a way that feels too much like a novelty to really stick. I can't really imagine new players nor long-time Trackmania fans sticking with this one for very long. The question then needs to be asked, is the very real momentum seen in these new campaign tracks one that the team at Nadeo can keep up going forward, or is this kind of inspiration more of an annual thing? Sure, if there's anything the last year of this game has emphasised, it's that it really is the community features you're actually subscribing for here. Those tracks remain as great as they ever were, but beyond the issues of charging a recurring fee for elements of the game that were readily available in previous entries, I mean to me they wholly represented the anarchic beauty of this franchise, it's those campaign courses that operate as the sales pitch for paying into the game at large, one whose success could be judged by directing you to the introduction of dog food ads outlined at the start of this piece. And so it all circles back around, will I keep up this subscription? I guess I'll have to see how things pan out over the next few months. There was a part of me that hoped that as time went on, it would become easier for discussions of the business side of Trackmania to fade into the background in favour of just appreciating the game for what it actually is. In reality though, it's starting to feel as if those discussions and the game itself are becoming more and more intertwined, leaving the identity of what I maintain should be the best, most successful racing franchise on the planet feeling more diffuse than it perhaps ever has done. Going forward, I really hope that the developers and publishers internalise that with that beautiful purity at the game's core, Trackmania really should be so much more simple than this.
And speaking of simple, let me simply lay out the benefits of today's sponsor Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community for creative and curious people. Explore new skills, deepen existing passions, and get lost in creativity with Skillshare's inspiring online classes on topics including illustration, photography, video, design, and more. If the purity of a game like Trackmania speaks to you, maybe try a class like writing character-driven short stories with Yoon Lee. Writing short stories, you're having to convey a lot of information about your scenario and your characters in a limited space. This class can Gives you practical advice on how to be as economical and evocative with your language as possible. What's more, Skillshare offers classes designed for real life and all the circumstances that come with it. These lessons can help you stay inspired, express yourself, and introduce you to a community of millions. And because Skillshare is sponsoring this video, the first thousand people who use the link in my description will receive a one month free trial to Skillshare Premium, so there's no risk to checking it out for yourself, and you'll really be helping out the channel in the process. Thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring the video, and I hope you all enjoyed this piece on Trackmania. Thanks a lot for watching. If you liked the video, you can really help the channel by clicking the corresponding button as well as subscribing. I'd also really appreciate it if you followed me on Twitch and checked out my podcast in the description below. I'd also like to thank my patrons here. These videos simply would not exist without your support, and I really do mean that. If you've enjoyed any of the videos I've put out and want to help the channel continue so I can keep making more, you can directly help out as well as get things like early access to completely ad-free video uploads by heading to patreon.com slash writing on games and pledging only what you feel comfortable with. I am forever thankful for your support in whatever form it takes. Special thanks go to Mark B. Writing, Artyom Vitsuk, Shardfire, Spike Jones, Jesse Ryan, Dallas Keen, Timothy Jones, Charlie Kimball, Tom Webster, Tommy Carver Chaplin, Winter, David Bjork, Lucas, Spray Snyder, Dr. Motorcycle, The Nameless Guy, Henry Milek, Hebe Amore, Lea Cinello, Ruth Natman, Nicholas Villeneuve, Captain Knisprich, Dana Sikowskis, Jordan Midler, Max Cohen, and Charlie Yang. And with that, this has been another episode of Writing on Games. Thank you all so much for watching. Stay safe and I will see you all next time.